And um, there's there's one other thing that I um, that I want to share with um, about how to use the the confidence interval to make the decision. Now we have two methods um, so far. We have the p-value approach, right? so how to make the decision in the in a hypothesis test. We have the p-value approach, and you know remember that one is that if p is less than alpha, then we reject. We'll even make it equal to. If p is is greater than alpha, then we do not reject. Uh, the second way is the classical approach. That's where you draw the sampling distribution and shade the region and identify the reject region and do not reject region, that one. And the third one is to use a confidence interval. And let me show you how that's gonna work. And I'm just gonna start off with an example. It, it works better for, for not equal to in the, in the alternative. Because it's assuming, because for our confidence interval, we've got area on the left and the right. But let's say that the uh, population proportion was 0.43. That was what the, the claim was. And then the alternative was, was not equal to 0.43. So what we would do then is we would draw the sampling distribution with 0.43, that's our P0 value, that goes right in the middle. So when someone makes a claim that the population proportion is 0.43, we assume that claim is to, to true. And then we see if there's evidence to reject what we assume to be true. All right, so there are two different kinds of um, confidence interval. So let's say we calculate a confidence interval and it turns out to be this here. And I'm just gonna extend this 0.43 all the way down. And let's say that the confidence interval turned out to be 0.35 to 0.41. And let's say that this is a 95% confidence interval. And you can calculate it in the normal way. You can use your calculator to calculate this. But if you'll notice, um, you know, 0.41 is right here and, and 0.35 is, is right here. This entire interval did not capture the 0.43. So if we were looking, if we interpreted this confidence interval, we would say that we are 95% confident that the true um, population proportion is somewhere between 0.35 and 0.41. Notice it didn't capture the 0.43, which was, was the claim. So this one here would give us evidence to reject that the population proportion is 0.43 because this interval does not capture 0.43, okay? On the other hand, if we had this confidence interval that ranged from say here over to here, and this one turned out to be 0.40 to 0.46, again, a 95% a confidence interval. Well, notice that 0.43 is in there, is in this interval. It would be right here on the way from 0.40 to 0.46. You know, not really drawn to scale, but you get the idea. 0.43 is in this interval. So we're 95% confident that the true population proportion is between 0.40 and 0.46. Well, what they assume to be true is in that interval. So this would be evidence to support that the population proportion is 0.43 because 0.43 is in that interval. All right, so here is how you use the confidence interval to make your decision. Or if you get a confidence interval that does not contain the P0, then you conclude that there's evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And if you find that the, the, the claimed population proportion is in the interval, then you say that there's evidence to support or not enough evidence to reject. All right, so that's how you use a confidence interval. So now we have three different approaches to help in this context to help us make the decision. Uh, there's a lot that you've been requested to add to this graph. Most of it is spelled out here, but there's one other piece in here. It says to find the standardized test statistic and plot it on the graph above. So that's what we did right there. So if you plot your test statistic, you see that it falls in the do not reject region. So the decision is do not reject. You can also compare the p-value, which is this number, to alpha, which is this number, and you can see P is greater than alpha. And if P is greater than alpha, same decision, same decision, do not reject. And for the confidence interval, um, here's the confidence interval that you would calculate from one prop Z int, there it is. And so I drew it graphically here, and then notice that the null hypothesis value, 0.72 is in that interval. So this would suggest that would give you evidence to support that the proportion is 0.75 because our confidence inter interval captured that number. All right, so here's one hypothesis test. Uh, it's related to proportions, so 10.2. 
uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go see the kind of go through the same pretty much the same stuff, but these claims that we're going to be looking at in 10.3 are claims that are made about the mean, the population mean. And then in one of your problems on the project, I ask you to construct a graph like this. So, you know, the software, PowerPoint and so on, not very good at constructing this. So you might want to just draw it by hand and then take a picture of it and insert the picture into the Excel document before you turn it in. I did extend the homework in um, my math lab for section 10.2, so you still have some days to go um, uh, finish that. Hypothesis testing, it's unbelievably difficult to figure out all the pieces until you figure out all the pieces. And after that, it'll be very easy. So if you're struggling with this now, you really, really, really need to fight and, 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 and study and go back and do as many examples as you can. Because this, this uh, stage that some of you are in where you don't understand what to do, it's to be expected. But as, as soon as you work through several, several of these problems, you'll see that you're going to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. So the sooner that you figure out the five steps and what you need to do, uh, the better you're going to be prepared to do all the other problems that follow. If you continue to not work and not figure things out or not work hard enough at it, you know, this stuff may never be figured out. Um, it's rare, but it, but it happens every now and then. And I can give you all these examples, but I can't organize them in your own mind. And the only way that you do that is by struggling through the problems, get frustrated, get mad, uh, say, I can't learn this stuff. Eventually you will, but, it, but you have to do the work. You have to do the work to, to understand it. And if that involves, you know, meeting with me for a half an hour in office hours where I can listen to you talk and listen to what you do understand and what you don't understand, then I'm willing to do that. But um, some of you are going to say this is hard and some of you are going to say this is easy. And the only difference between the two of you is that one of you figured it out and did enough work to understand it. It's not something that you can't understand. It's just it's the logic is hard. I mean, who would ever think, you know? Let's, let's make an assumption we don't know that's true and try to find evidence to reject that assumption. It's, it's, a, it's a logic that you don't normally see, but that's the logic of hypothesis testing. Make a, make a claim that you hope to reject. <laughs> so rejecting the null hypothesis leads you to what you want to show, which is the, the alternative hypothesis is sometimes called the research hypothesis. This is really what you want to show as a researcher. Uh, and so what you do is you claim something else. Contradict the original claim, and then you show what it is that you want to want to show. Okay, so we're going to be going through, uh, and here's some notes from section 10.3. You'll see it's very um, similar. Uh, the big difference is that um, claims will be made about means instead of proportions. And so uh, you're, you're you have a two-tailed test, a left-tailed test, and a right-tailed test, and the, the main variable is the mean, and that's the population mean, because we want to make claims about population means. This mu zero value, um, this is the very first number. It's always going to be a number. It's going to be a mean that somebody claims about, and the we had uh, t interval before, and the calculator function that we're going to use for this one is t test. And the very first number that it asks for is, you know, what is the mu zero? So that's the number that you put uh, in this spot right here. But we'll get to that later on. The test statistic. And again, there's a classical approach where you draw the graph. And there's a p-value approach where you calculate the test statistic and the p-value from the calculator using t-test. Notice it's the same z-score that we've calculated before. You take the sample mean, subtract the population mean, or what you assume the population mean to be, and then you divide by this standard error term for a mean. <laughs> Make the decision, p-value, same thing. If p is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. And for the classical approach, either you're going to have a two-tailed test like we had in our group project or our group work, or a one-tailed left, one-tailed right. And then if you, when you calculate the test statistic, 
If it falls in the shaded region, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis. If it falls in the non-shaded region, then we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis. So all of this is the same, right, uh, as before. Uh, here are the calculator steps. Uh, notice it's the, the t-test that we want. I'll be showing you that. So what I'd like to do is to go through a couple of examples and try to give you, in the time that we have, a variety of of uh, problems from the from the homework exercises. So this is uh, section 10.3, testing claims that are made about a single population mean. Okay, so um, here is one example of how the hypotheses will look. So let me just write these down. In this case, uh, the <clears throat> usually it would be the case that uh, if you have a, a greater than that, this would be the claim down here. Uh, the other information, from the problem says that we have a simple random sample where the sample size is 25 is obtained from a population that is known to be normally distributed. Okay, so if you recall back in chapter nine, uh, we said we can uh, assume a T distribution if the population is uh, approximately normal, particularly if we have a small sample size, less than 30. All right, so we calculate the sample mean and the sample standard deviation from the data. And we get these two numbers. And it wants us to compute the test statistic. And then they give us the alpha level, and they want us to determine the critical values. And then they want us to draw the t-distribution. So they're really walking you through the classical approach here. And then will the researcher reject the null hypothesis? All right, so pretty much what they're asking for here is to go ahead and use the classical approach. I think I've captured all the information from the problem. I'll write down the alpha, 0 0.01. Uh, it does say that we're a T distribution. And remember, when we're dealing with the mean, the degrees of freedom is always going to be same as before, the one, one less than the sample size. All right, so this is, a, this is good practice to do the classical approach. Uh, the difference here is that we're going to use the t distribution, so we have to use the t critical values instead of the z critical values. All right, the other thing that's different than our group prob um, problem is that this is a one-tailed right test greater than 40. So all of the area, the critical region that we shade is going to be in the greater than region to the right. So this is what we're looking at, classical approach, start to finish. All right, so the first thing we know is that since the sample size is 25, the degrees of freedom is one less than that, or 24. So the distribution, if they ask you, you know, what is the distribution, you're going to have to say it's the T distribution with 24 degrees of freedom. So there's our distribution. We see that because of that greater than sign, we have a right-tailed test. So that's going to lead us to shade the critical region over here to the right. And since alpha is equal to 0 0.01, and we're dealing with a, a one-tailed test, a right-tailed test in this case, all of the alpha goes in the one tail, in the right tail. We don't have to split it here and put half in the right, half in the left. All right. Now, immediately when we draw that line in the sand there, that determines the reject region and the do not reject region. The T distribution also has the zero right in the middle. Our one critical value over here and remember that critical values correspond to the alpha. And there's only one. It's over here to the right of zero. So it must be positive. This area is 0.01. So the variable that we give to this is t of 0.01. And then you can either use your calculator or you can use the t table to find the, criti the critical values. So let me throw up the table here. Uh, the area in the right tail is 0.01. And then if we come down to degrees of freedom, 24, it's that number right there. I don't know if you can read it. It says 2.492. So this whole table is about critical values. This is the one we use here, 2.492. All right, just for the notes, um, I will go degrees of freedom, 24, right area, 0 0.01. And so just to refresh your memory to go look at the t-table, and this is 2.49. If you use the calculator function, 
uh, t of 0 0.01, we're going to use inverse t. And the way the calculator function works is it always works with left area. So we can't just type in 0.01, we have because that's the right area. We have to type in the left area. Well, if there's 0.01 area here, then 0.99 over to the to the left. So this first number in here is 0.99. And the second number is always going to be the degrees of freedom. And that's 24. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate that, even though we know what the answer is, rounded to three decimal places. Now, some of you, if you have the earlier calculators, you're not going to have inverse t. But on my calculator, it's there, so I'll use it. If you don't have it, you still have the table version on how to find it and just compare that to this number here and then they round it to three decimal places in the table. All right, so in the classical approach, probably the hardest step is to find those critical values. Well, there it is. So we have everything that we need. Now, what we don't have is we need to plot the test statistic along this horizontal scale here, this T value, and it's given by this formula, X bar minus what someone assumes the population mean to be. So up here, this number that's in the null hypothesis, this number is the mu zero value. And then we divide by the standard error term. Now, they give us all this information in the problem. Here was what they calculated X bar to be, 42.3. And then the mu zero value is the number in the null hypothesis that they assume the population mean to be. All right, then we're going to take the standard deviation that they give us again in the problem, 4.3, and divide by the square root of the sample size, which they also gave us up here to be 25. So they have to give you all the information that enables you to calculate this thing here, which is called the test statistic. It's also a t-value, so it's also a number we're going to plot on the horizontal scale of our sampling distribution. Because if we can plot this number, on this scale, we'll see if it falls in the do not reject region or the reject region. All right, so let me go ahead and calculate that. And I get 2.674 and some change. So let's take a look. Rem uh, what you have to remember is that zero for these standardized um, graphs, T distribution, Z distribution, so on, zero is in the middle. And then here's our critical value, 2.4. And then you have to go plot 2.67. Well, 2.67 is just a little bit bigger than 2.49. So it's out here somewhere. This is our test statistic. They are both T values. And since they're T values, they will be plotted on the horizontal scale. And I'll just round it to three decimal places. So there it is. It falls in the reject region. So the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. And if we reject, see what I mean? How we, we make a, a claim and our goal is to reject that claim, because if we reject that claim, then we support our research hypothesis that the mean is larger than 40. So we reject in favor of the alternative. So we want to say there's evidence to support the claim. Now, we're not given a context in this one. So the best that we can say is you know, that the population mean is greater than 40. All right, the last thing I want to show you is um, the calculator function. So what can you get from the calculator function? So t test. Now the, the, the calculator function will calculate the test statistic for us. And that's the big advantage of that. We don't have to plug things into a formula like this. But from here on out, we're going to be using the calculator function and not the formulas. I don't know if you remember from the confidence interval section where we use t interval for means, but it also asks you um, if you're going to be using raw data or if you're going to be using the summary statistics. In this case, we have the summary statistics. We don't have the raw data. We don't have the numbers that we could put into L1 of our calculator, for example. All right, now after you establish that and you select this option, they're going to ask for mu zero, which we already mentioned was 40. That's the number up here. It's also the number that the calculator will need because it's going to, the calculator always returns the test statistic. And to calculate the test statistic, it needs to know that mu zero value, right? And then it's going to ask for the summary statistics, X bar 
Sx and n. And in most of our problems, that information is given. Here's the x bar, here's the Sx, and here's the net n. You just have to put them in the right spot. So 42.3 and 4.3 and 25. Now, in order to calculate the p value, it needs to know something about the alternative hypothesis. So it needs to know something about the null hypothesis. That is, what is the mu zero value? And it needs to know something about the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so in this one, uh, here's your mu zero value. So in the alternative, we have greater than mu zero. There are three possibilities correspond to the three different kinds of tests. And we want the one that says greater than mu zero. For a two-tailed test, we would select the not equal to mu zero. And for a left-tailed test, we would select the less than mu zero. All right, and then the output, what you're looking for is T and P. The first thing that it gives you is the T, which is our test statistic. And if you're, as you're trying to figure this out, just remember that the test statistic and the critical values are both T values. So those two numbers, there might be two critical values in a two-tailed test there is, but there are. But the calculator functions will always return the test statistic for the situation and the p-value. So we might as well just put these in here just to confirm that we do get this test statistic of 2.674. So let's go to the stat menu and over to tests. T-test comes up early. It's like the second option. It's one of the more popular um, tests that we do. We're going to select the stats option. Uh, P0 is 40. Uh, X bar is 42.3. SX is 4.3. Sample size 25. And we're going to select the greater than mu0 option. And we're just going to calculate. All right? Tells you what your test was, your alternative hypothesis. And then it gives you um, greater than 40. And it gives you this test about test statistic. And notice that it is exactly the same thing, correct to, you know, whatever, nine decimal places that they give us here. Same thing we found up here. And then the p-value, 0 0.006630926. And then it repeats back the mean and the standard deviation in 25. Oops, I don't see that very well. There it is. So the output, mu greater than zero, gives us the test statistic which is the same one we calculated up here, and then the p-value, and then it reports back the mean and the standard deviation and the sample size. It's not so interesting in this example because we gave it these values, but if you had your numbers, your, all of your data values, the raw data values dumped into a list, you wouldn't know what the mean would, the sample mean is. And so it calculates it for you. Uh, the only other thing I'll point out is that the other way we make the decision is to compare p and alpha Alpha is 0.01, P is 0 0.00, I'll just round it to seven. And this P value is less than the alpha value. And when P is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So same five steps, different distribution, T distribution instead of a Z distribution. But a lot of the, the steps are, are very similar. All right, so, I mean, all I can do at this point is to take you through some, um, some examples, some, con some context. But, you know, the, and, and maybe we'll go through the five steps or just answer these questions here. Are women getting taller? In 1990, the mean height of women 20 years of age or older was 63.7. That's five feet, 3.7 inches. That was the average height of women 20 years ago. No, more than 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So what they're giving here is there's no mention that this information was taken from a sample. So this is not a sample mean that they're given, but it does say mean and it does say height. This is what they're claiming the population mean to be, 63.7 inches. And then down here, it starts talking about the sample. 
Okay, so we want to take a sample today and calculate the average height of, of women and to, to, see, to see if the average height today is a little bit larger than what it was back there. So suppose that a random sample of 45 women who are 20 years of age or older results in a mean height of 63.9. Now, you can see it is a little higher than 63.7. And the question is for us as statisticians is, is that difference that we observe, is it statistically significant? Is this great and greater than enough, in other words? All right, so um, in some of these problems, they only ask you for pieces of the five steps. So let's take a look at this one here. It says state the appropriate null and alternative hypotheses to assess whether women are taller today. So buried in there is a claim that women are taller today. That is, they're, and if we translate that into the information that we've been given, we would say that the average height today is greater than what it was back then. All right, so the mean is greater than what it was back then. And the equal to sign goes in the null hypothesis. These will have the same number. These numbers are the mu zero values. Our null hypothesis is that the mean is 63.7. And the alternative hypothesis, this is what we're trying to show, is that the average height of women is larger than what it was back then. If the p-value is equal to 0 0.35, uh, this is the probability of getting our test statistic, or our, um, yeah, our test statistic that corresponds to this mean is equal to this number or something greater, and then write a conclusion. And here we can see at alpha equals 0 0.10, if the p-value is 0.35 and the alpha value is 0 0.10, then the relational symbol that goes between these two numbers is greater than, so therefore p is greater than zero or greater than um, alpha, and that means that we do not reject the null hypothesis. All right, so for, um, for part B, the probability, the p-value, is the probability of getting our sample result or something more extreme. So we're assuming that 63.7, that's our mu zero. If you want to construct the p-value, you plot the x-bar that we, that we got, which was 63.9, and then you calculate the probability of getting that sample mean or something more extreme. And because we have a greater than um, one-tailed right test, more extreme means anything off to the right of that. This is the p-value, 0.35. So the probability of getting 63.9, which is what, uh, what we got in our sample, or something even further away from 63.7, the probability of getting this number or something more extreme is, is 0.35. There's a 35% chance of getting a sample mean larger than 39.63.9. <clears> point <throat> So explain what that value represents, p-value. Probability of getting 63.9 or something more extreme. It's that area right there. Oh, it does say write the conclusion. I haven't done that yet. So since we're not going to reject, okay, then this is plausible. We don't have enough information to support the claim. So we're going to say there is not enough information or not enough evidence to support the claim. And, you know, I could say here that the mean is greater than 63.7, but I'm just going to say it in layman's term that women are getting taller. Women may in fact be getting taller. It's just that our evidence did not suggest that they were. All right, there's one other uh, kind of problem that I want to show you. And um, that's the one where when we run the when we run the t-test, we're going to, from the calculator, did I get something wrong here? 0.01? Oh, oh, I see. You're referring to problem number four. So when I did number four, I was referring, I was using a 0.01, and Emerson said, no, you should have used alpha equals 0.0 or 0 0.10. So rather than change everything else, I'm just going to change this problem to 0.01. You know, and then since our probability value was so low, it was both less than 0.01, but also less than 0 0.10. So nothing else would change here except the critical value. So this picture might be a little different. All right, uh, I'm going to ask you to enter in these values. Okay, so these values 
there's a 64 ounce jug and there's a machine that fills it. And so uh, the quality control person randomly selects 22 bottles and measures the liquid inside it. And you can see some of them put less than 64 ounces in the, um, in the bottle and some of them put more than 64 ounces in the bottle. But it's a machine that fills them and so there's gonna be some variation there in the amount of liquid that they put in there. So uh, when you see a list of data like this, we're gonna enter data values into a list and we can go ahead and put them into L1. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. And then we're gonna go through the steps of the hypothesis test. But in this case, when we select t-test, we're not gonna select the stats option, rather we're gonna select the data option. So that's what I wanted to show you here. So uh, let's take a couple of minutes and enter in all of the data values that you see here into L1. I will have a delay as we do this. All right, so it looks like my last data value is in position 22. So I probably should scroll through them just to make sure that I didn't leave off any characters. All right, so they underfilled a little bit here by 0.06 ounces. And it looks like they overfilled on the maximum one by about 0.1 ounce. So the machine seems to be doing a pretty good job of filling these bottles. Okay, a certain brand of apple juice is supposed to have 64 ounces because the penalty for underfilling bottles is severe. You're cheating your consumer. Uh, the target mean amount of juice is a little bit higher than that, 64.05. However, the filling mean, uh, machine is not precise. And the exact amount of juice varies from bottle to bottle, as you can see here. Quality control manager wishes to verify that the mean amount of juice in each bottle is 64.05, so that she can ensure that the machine is not overfilling or underfilling. She randomly selects 22 bottles, and here are the contents. All right, so you wanna make sure that when you do this list, you don't have any outliers. Um, we're just going to assume in most of our problems that the normality criteria is, is achieved. And then the question is, should the assembly line be shut down so that the machine can be recalibrated? And it can be recalibrated if we find a statistically significant difference between what the, the machine is actually on, on average putting in the bottles and this targeted amount of 64.05. So Let's go through the five steps. We want the mean to be 64.05. We set up the machine so that it's like that. Now, we don't know, however, if, if the mean is not 64.05, if the, if the machine is actually on average overfilling or underfilling. So the sign that we're gonna put here in the middle is not equal to. And we're gonna claim that the machine is filling the bottles appropriately so that the mean of all these bottles would be 64.05. Rejecting this claim would mean that there's a problem with the filling machine, and we should shut down the line. If it's dramatically underfilling or dramatically overfilling, we have a problem. We need to go and recalibrate the machine to get it back up so that the average is, or get it back down, so that the average is 64.05. Step one. Step two, alpha is 0.01. See it down here. Step three, we're going to use the t-test. All right, so the data or the input here, we're going to select the data because we have the raw data and we put the raw data into a list. So I'm not sure what it says here, maybe X list and we'll indicate L1. And once we know what list we're looking at, the calculator still needs to know that number in the null hypothesis, the 64.05, but we don't have to report the X bar and the SX in the end because we have all the data in our list and the calculator can go look at all the data in that list and calculate X bar, SX, and N. All right, it still needs to have some uh, information about the alternative hypothesis and that's what that last row is. So we come up here and we see not equal to is the one we want. So not equal to mu zero is the alternative hypothesis selection we make. 
All right, uh, let's go enter that information in. Tests, T tests. All right, and so this time we're going to move over to data and hit enter the mu zero value, 64.05. The list uh, looks like it just says list and not X list is L1. It also looks like these two are switched. Uh, frequency, generally, we're always just going to leave frequency equal to one. Some calculators, you leave it blank. We're going to select the not equal to icon. And then we're going to calculate. What are we going to calculate? It's always the same. The test statistic. In this case, it's a T and the p-value. The test statistic is negative 4.49, some change. And then the p-value is. All right, so here's the first instance where we've seen this. And I have to bring your attention to this. Because if you're not paying attention, you might say that the p-value is 2.01. And as you know about probability values, they must take on values between 0 and 1. So if you ever report the p-value is point, there's 2.0, then you really don't understand what the p-value is. It's got to be between 0 and 1. And you can see that this number is, in fact, between 0 and 1 because it's in scientific notation. So we have to move this decimal place four places to the left. So 1, 2, 3, 2, 0, 1, 3, 5, and so on. So it's a very, very small p-value. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis here. So p, which is 0 0.0002, is less than alpha, which is 0 0.01. So we reject the null hypothesis. p is less than alpha. This case, when we reject the null hypothesis, we're rejecting the claim that the average is, that the machine is calibrated correctly and that the average amount of apple juice that it's dumping into these 64 ounce containers is in fact 64.05 ounces. So since we're rejecting that the average is 64.05, that means that the average is not equal to 64.5. So it's either underfilling or it's overfilling. And when we come over here, we see that the average in our sample was 64.007, and the standard deviation was 0 0.0446. So it looks like it's under, or since the mean is less than 64.05, then it turns out that the machine is underfilling. We want the average to be 64.05. We actually find an average that's less than that. So because we rejected the null hypothesis, we should close down the process and go recalibrate the machine because clearly it's underfilling. Is it underfilling the bottles? No. Is it under this benchmark of 64.05? Yes. But look at the averages. The average is 64.007. It's still putting more than 64 ounces of apple juice in these bottles. So you know, the quality control person might say, ah, it's okay. The average is still above 64. But according to their rules, they should shut down the process and go recalibrate the filling machine. All right, the last thing that I want to uh, do is to do one more confidence interval, and we'll do it from this problem. So let's go look at T interval. Since we rejected the null hypothesis, our interval will not capture 65, 64.05. Let's confirm that, and we're going to go down to T interval. And uh, the input again, since we still have all that data there, will be in L1. Frequency is 1. You can always let this be 1 for problems like this. And the C level here, well, we have to go back to the, uh, the alpha value. The alpha was 0.01. So that would correspond to a 99% confidence interval. And then when we calculate, we get the interval from 63.98 to 64.035. And then notice that our mu zero value, which was 64.05, is not in this interval. So our interval didn't capture the 64.05, what we assume to be the average amount of apple juice going into those, those bottles. And so 
This is another more evidence to suggest that we should reject the null hypothesis. Clearly, this machine is underfilling the bottles, putting less than 64.05 ounces in them. Is it practically significant? No. The difference between 0.05 and 0.007, if we're talking about apple juice ounces, is practically insignificant. So even though they would shut down the machine to recalibrate the machine, they're not going to worry about all the bottles that have been filled already, because on average, they're still getting more than 64 ounces. OK, uh, you have several examples. These sorts of problems like this, if there's one problem that's most like the projects, it's this one, because this is the one where you have all the data. Like our project, you have all of the temperatures. So our project problems are most like this one here. So you can use this one as a model.